Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Rutgers Geology Museum's Oceans Late Night. Um, so we have a great lineup for you tonight. We are going to start with a trivia game, and we will have our crafts, and then we will have our speaker, Ryan Globke, speak to us about oceans. So we're going to get started right away with our trivia. Um, so Lauren, are you are you ready? I am ready. Hi, Ria. Here. Oh, <laughs> Lincoln's here too and ready. He's been waiting hi, to say hi to you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So hi, Lincoln. And everyone, if you want to play the trivia, you can go ahead and scan that QR code. It will take you to menti.com. You could also go to menti.com and enter that eight digit code. Uh, the code's right there on the screen, 164-65118. So to, to play, you can scan that QR code or go to the website. You can also put your answers in the chat for us and uh, make sure to keep track of your score so that at the end, we can let us know how you did. So let's get started with question number one. How much of the Earth's surface is covered by water? Is it A, 15%? B, 35%, C, 71%, or D, 92%. Okay, let's see. Baby's here too, so he's making noises. Um, we have most people picking uh, B and C right now. I say... And most people saying C. <laughs> Okay, most people think C. So let's find out. So the correct answer is C. About 71% of the Earth's surface is water covered. And the oceans hold about 96.5% of all Earth's water. Question two, how many named oceans are there? A, two, B, three, C, four, or D, five? Sorry, I was a little slow on resetting it. So um, they people are just starting to answer now. We have answers coming in for C and D right now. And most people are saying letter D still. Okay, so the correct answer is D, five. Most people today agree that there are five ocean basins, the Atlantic, Pacific, Indian, Arctic, and Southern Oceans. Question three, ocean water is salty. Where does the salt come from? A, from hydrothermal vents, B, from the land, C, from the sea creatures, or D, from meteorites? Lincoln says that it's not from meteorites. That's what he just told me. Um, so we have people picking A and B right now. Oh, and some and C. Pretty tied right now, but yeah, between A and B, slightly more for letter B. Okay, the correct answer is B from the land. Oceans get their salt from rocks on land. Ocean waves and rain pound against rocks, eroding off mineral salts. The eroded material then makes its way into the oceans. Question four, what percentage of the Earth's water is fresh water? A, 0.03%, B, 0.3%, C, 3%, or D, 30%. Okay, say? so we have answers for B and C right now. I don't fall for B. Wait, I don't fall for 30. Okay, Lincoln. <laughs> 30 is actually too much. <laughs> Sorry. All right. So we have most people picking letter B right now, but a few people picking C. Okay, so let's let's find out. The correct answer is. 
Only about 3% of Earth's entire water supply is fresh water. The other 97% is salt water. Question five, where is most of Earth's fresh water found? A, ice caps and glaciers, B, lakes, C, rivers, or D, aquifers? Lincoln is voting for none of them, so, <laughs> but we have other people voting for A and B right now, uh, with actually... most people picking A. Okay, so let's find out. And A, ice caps and glaciers is the correct answer. While only 3% of the planet's water is fresh water, only about 1% of it can be used as drinking water. Most of it is locked up in glaciers, ice, permafrost, or buried deep in the ground. And once again, if you are just joining us, we are playing Ocean's Trivia. So you can scan that QR code, or you can go to Menti and enter that eight-digit code right on the screen. Keep track of your score and let us know how you did. Question number six. Which is the largest ocean in the world? A, Atlantic, B, Pacific, C, Indian, or D, Arctic? Okay, let's see what we have. Oh, I feel for B, I feel for B. I feel for B. It looks like everyone is overwhelmingly ah. saying letter B right now. Okay, letter B, okay, let's see. B, Pacific. The Pacific Ocean Basin is correct. It's about 63 million square miles, which is large enough to hold every continent on Earth. That is pretty big. All right, next question. Number seven, what is the name of the super ocean that existed 250 million years ago? Is it the A, the Tethys, B, Pangaea, C, Rodinia, or D, Pantalassa? We also have some super enthusiastic people participating in the chat. So thank you for <laughs> those of you participating there. So we don't have Who's very many. Being... We don't have very many votes yet. I think people are. This is a tricky one. Um, but right now we have people voting for A, B, and D. What about C? So they're all kind of the same. Ooh. None. Of, not really. One is pulling ahead just yet. Slightly more for D at the moment. Okay, so for Pantalassa. Okay, so let's reveal the correct answer. The correct answer is D, Pantalassa. The Pantalassic Ocean was a super ocean surrounding the supercontinent Pangaea during the Paleozoic and Mesozoic eons. Number eight, what is the average depth of the modern oceans? Is it A, 3,000 feet, B, 5,000 feet, C, 10,000 feet, or D, 12,000 feet? Okay, let's see. We have just a few <laughs> votes right now I want to see D. between C and D. I didn't see D. Most people are saying D right now. Okay, so let's see. And that is correct. Our best estimate of the average ocean floor depth is about 12,100 feet or 2.3 miles deep. Number nine, what is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge? A, an ocean trench. B, a mountain range. C, a tectonic plate. Or D, none of these. Let's see, we have no answers. No one's voting yet. I'm up pretty split. So we've got answers for A, B, and D. I and it's dead even between all of those. So, oh, and there's some for C. So people don't okay. know. All right, let's find out. 
So correct answer is B, a mountain range. The Mid-Atlantic Ridge is an underwater mountain range that is part of the longest mountain range in the world and separates the North and South American tectonic plates from the Eurasian and African tectonic plates. Question number 10, which ocean trench is the deepest in the world? Is it A, the Tonga Trench, B, Mariana Trench, C, the Kiril Kamchatka Trench, or D, Philippine Trench? All right, we have overwhelming quick response for letter B right now. Yeah, no other answers. Everyone says letter B. Okay, awesome. So let's find out. And that is the correct answer. So B, the Mariana Trench, not to be confused with the band. As I learned a couple of years ago, there is a band by the same name. Challenger Deep is the deepest part of the Mariana Trench, measuring approximately 36,000 feet deep. So this means that it is 7,000 feet deeper than Mount Everest is tall. So you could fit Mount Everest inside there. That is very deep. And once again, if you are just joining us, you can play, uh, play our trivia, Oceans Trivia, by scanning that QR code or going to Menti and entering that eight digit code. Question 11, which of the following ocean canyons is found off the eastern coast of the US? A, Hudson Canyon, B, Grand Canyon, C, Monterey Canyon, or D, Fraser Canyon? All right, just a couple votes in. We have split between A and C. And, yep, still up oh, and some for B. So A, B, and C, but slightly ahead is A right now. Okay, so let's find out. A is correct. The Hudson Canyon begins off the coast of New Jersey where the Hudson River meets the ocean. In some places, it is almost a mile deep, making it comparable to the Grand Canyon. The Monterey Canyon is uh, actually on the other side off of the coast of California, for those of you who are interested. Question number 12, which of these causes ocean waves to be made? Is it A, sunlight, B, wind, C, temperature, or D, glaciers? Okay, some answers coming in. We have a split between B and C right now. And it's still dead even split between B and C. Okay. So the correct answer for this one is B, wind. Waves are created by friction between the wind and the surface of the ocean. As the wind blows across the water, the continual disturbance creates wave crests. Question number 13, which of these creates ocean currents? A, wind, B, water density, C, tides, or D, all of the above? Okay, so waiting for some answers to come in. We just have a few for letter D right now. More votes coming in, all for letter D still. Okay, so correct answer is D, all of the above. Ocean currents can be caused by all different factors, including wind, density differences in water masses, and events such as earthquakes or storms. Question number 14. Ocean currents in the Northern Hemisphere flow in a blank direction, so you have to fill in the blank. Is it A, clockwise, B, counterclockwise, C, straight or D, they do not flow. So once again, you're filling in that blank and the question is ocean currents in the Northern Hemisphere flow in a blank direction. So 
in the northern hemisphere, we're looking for which way the ocean currents are. Is it clockwise, counterclockwise, straight, or they don't flow? So a couple answers still coming in. We have a split between A and B. With just one more by a head by one is B. Okay. So the correct answer for this one is A. The ocean surface currents flow in large loops called gyres. In the northern hemisphere, they flow clockwise. Southern hemisphere, they flow counterclockwise. If you've ever noticed uh, like a hurricane on the TV forecast and you can see that it's moving clockwise in the Northern hemisphere. Which current runs along the Eastern coast of the US? Is it A, the Antarctic current? B, Kiroshio current? C, the Gulf stream? Or D, the Eastern Pacific Current. Okay, let's see. Uh, answers still coming in. We have everything but B at this moment. Uh, it's split between A and C for the most votes with C just a tad higher than the rest of them. Okay, so the correct answer for this is C. The Gulf Stream is a strong ocean current that brings warm water from the Gulf of Mexico into the Atlantic Ocean. It extends all the way up the Eastern coast of the United States and Canada. Question number 16, which US state A, Alaska, B, California, C, Florida, or D, Hawaii? Still waiting for some answers. Only have two right now. Oh, here we go. Getting a few more. And we have all answers selected. <laughs> this is a tough one. We have C and D tied. And yep, so still C and D are tied with uh, B second place and A in last. Okay. So the correct answer for this one is A, Alaska has 6,640 miles of coastline, which is more than the rest of the United, all of the rest of the United States combined. And if you include islands, it has almost 34,000 miles of coastline. <clears throat> Question number 17. Scientists estimate that about 1 million animal species live in the ocean, and many of them are fish. What is the largest fish in the ocean? Is it A, a mola mola, B, a giant manta ray, C, a basking shark, or D, whale shark? Okay, uh, so waiting for some responses. We have some enthusiastic letter Ds in the chat. And we have A, B, and D selected on Menti with D pulling ahead right now. Okay, so the correct answer is B. Whale sharks can grow up to 40 feet long and weigh up to 20,000 pounds. And that is as tall as two giraffes stacked on top of each other and the weight of two elephants combined. It's very big. Number 18, there are seven different species of sea turtle. Which one is the largest? A, loggerhead turtle. B, Kemp's Ridley turtle. C, leatherback turtle or D, hawksbill turtle? Okay, let's see. We have a couple answers. We have for A and C, pretty split right now. That's Clay voicing his opinion. 
Uh, it's still pretty dead even between letters A and C. Okay, so between A and C. So let's find out. The correct answer is C, leatherback turtles. Leatherback turtles are the largest type of sea turtle, measuring up to seven feet long and weighing over 2,000 pounds. Question 19, what is the fastest fish in the ocean? Is it A, a sailfish, B, swordfish, C, mako shark, or D, ocean sunfish? All right, it looks like people in the chat are saying B or C. And online, we have a split between A and C. Okay. So, but we have letter A just a tiny bit ahead. Okay, so the correct answer for this, the fastest fish in the ocean is a sailfish. The Indo-Pacific sailfish has been clocked in at 68 miles per hour. It's faster than the speed limit on the Garden State Parkway. I like that fun fact, whoever wrote that. All right, so the next, I think this is our final question for trivia. Which of the sea animals below does not live on the ocean floor? A, sea star, B, sea rabbit, C, sea cucumber, or D, sea lion? We're looking for the sea animal that does not live on the ocean floor. Okay, so we have everyone picking letter D right now. Just a few though. A couple other answers coming in for B, but still majority of people saying letter D. Okay. So the correct answer is indeed it is D sea lion. So sea stars, which are starfish, sea cucumbers, and sea bunnies, a type of nudibranch or a shellless snail, all live on the seafloor. In contrast, sea lions swim near the surface of the ocean. Okay, and so I also have a fun fact for sea lions. If you ever get confused between sea lions and a seal, for a sea lion, you can see their ear flap. It's like on the outside. And for seals, you, you can't see the flap for their ears. That is a fun fact if you need to distinguish between a sea lion and a seal. All right, so let's find out how everybody did. So if you got zero to 10 questions correct, zero to 10 questions correct, you were a mariner. If you got 11 to 15 correct, you were a marine biologist. And 16 to 20 correct, you are an oceanographer. I think everybody did really well today, so you can pat yourselves on the back. And uh, you do let us know in the chat how many questions you got and what, what role you have now. Okay, looks like a lot of you did really well, awesome. So for our next, um, next segment, we are doing crafts. All right, so what you're gonna be doing is we are going to be making something called a foram. So it's short for the word foraminifera, which is, you still might not know what that is. That is a micro fossil. It is a really tiny, tiny shell that you look at under a microscope. So this is what they look like under a microscope. They're super duper small. And so what you'll be needing for this um, is you'll be needing clay or Play-Doh and a pencil or a stick. Um, to make some details and, and make some holes in, in our forums. Okay, so I'm gonna get my supplies out as well. And you can go ahead and get yours. And I'll be walking you through how to make some of these shapes. All right, so. Before we, so you've gotten your clay or Play-Doh out. So I'll just give you a little bit of a background. I already told you that it is a tiny, tiny, tiny thing. It is a single celled organism. They live, they're found in the ocean. So they are distributed in um, all, over the, all over the ocean in different places, different latitudes uh, based on what kinds of nutrients are available. So it's kind of like going to an all you can eat buffet, right? Some of you 
uh, eat certain foods more than others, right? Everyone eats something different. So there's many different types of, of forams, all different types of species. So some of them love to live in warm weather, warm water, and some of them love cold water and they eat algae and bacteria. Their shell is made, it's called a test actually. So their shell is what we're gonna be making with Play-Doh today. And it's made out of something called calcium carbonate. So like the seashells you find on, on the beaches, right? So it's made out of that material. And they're actually really useful because scientists can actually study past climates using their shells. They can look at the chemistry, they can look at what their shells are made out of, and they can figure out if there was an ice age or if there wasn't in the past. And that's so small, and they can figure that out from that. I'm sure Ryan will tell you more about all this in his talk. And so we are making different shapes, right? These different tests. So there's two main types of forams today. So there are which live on the seafloor. So those forams you'll see are a little flat. Uh, so like this one is a benthic, this one, this guy here, they're kind of like kind of like saucers, like flying space saucers. They're like flat and planktonic, which float in the water. So many of you, maybe you watch SpongeBob SquarePants, you know who owns the chum bucket? It's plankton, right? So planktonic forums, they live at the surface and they float and they look like popcorn. If I go back, this one is planktonic. It looks like popcorn. Okay, and those are um, this part here. These round parts called, are called chambers. Okay, so we're gonna make that too. Okay, and here are some more shapes which we are going to model today. Okay, and you can see all of these different shapes have different names, which we're not gonna get into. And let's get started. So let me just stop sharing so you can see this better. And I'll switch my camera view. It looks like my other camera is not working right now. So that's okay. We can, I can still show you how to make these. So I have some of my clay and I am going to be making this one here. Let me share my screen again. I'm making this one here. It's the easiest one first, so we can get started. I'm making a planet spiral evolute. So you can just take your Play-Doh or your clay and just roll it. Roll it into a long, like a long, or like a thick string, like a noodle. I'm still, Still rolling it out. Okay, so I have a long string right now made out of clay. And so for the planet spiral, all you're gonna do is you're going to take one end and start rolling it. It's kind of like a, uh, a cinnamon bun, if you ever ate those before. And you can use any color you want. You can make it like bright red, yellow. If you want to make a pink one. Okay, so here's my cinnamon bun looking, looking at 4 a.m. And right here, I'm going to make a little hole. So I'm going to take, uh, I'm going to use an eraser and see if I can 
poke a hole here. And there you go. Okay, so if you want to compare it to the picture. So I made this one here, the planet spiral one. So there it is. And you can add some details to that too. So I had some lines on it. So I'm going to add Okay, there you go. Okay, so there's one. Now we're gonna make another one. So we're gonna make a little bit more complex one. So let's make this one. So I think we can make a tri cereal. Okay, we'll make a tri cereal shape here. So this one looks like a grape, and I'll show you how to make this one. So I'm gonna take a piece of my clay and I'm actually going to form uh, a couple of a little round balls. So I'll let you know how many. So I got one. Two. There's three. Got four. Five. Six. Seven. Eight. And I'm going to make four more. So you'll need nine, there's nine, there's my 10, 11, and 12. So I have 12 balls right now and they're sticking together. Okay, so what you wanna do is you're gonna take we make two balls like stick together like that, and then two stick together underneath that. And then I'm gonna put another one sticking underneath. You want the shape to be kind of like a V shape. So I'm gonna kind of like shape it a little bit here. So it's gonna be wider at the top. And then it's gonna be like a little narrower at the bottom, kind of like a grape. Okay, and then I have like kind of one smaller one at the bottom. So here's like our base shape. And then on top of that, I'm just gonna place these balls like right there. Another one's gonna go right there. And another right here. Okay, and so if I compare that, I just, one thing I need to do is I need to make um, the opening, that hole is called an aperture. So I'm gonna make a little aperture on the bigger side. So I'm gonna use my eraser. There we go. That's our tri cereal. Okay. So far we have two different shapes. Oh, it's sticking. Okay. So here's one. Here's our other one. Okay. So the next one we're going to make is 
We're going to make a flask single chamber. So that's this one here, the first one. Looks kind of like a uh, flower flower vase, right? Okay, so what I'm going to do is I am just going to form a ball first. And then I'm going to start squishing the top and try to like stretch it out. But I still want the bottom to have kind of like an oval shape. And the top, I need an aperture. I'm going to make a hole there. So I think I'm gonna make mine a little bit wider. So I'm gonna add some more Play-Doh to the sides. All right, and I think I'm ready. And you can make, you can see there's some lines on it. So some horizontal lines, you can use a pencil and make the indention for the lines. Okay, so we have three different shapes. So let's see if we can make one or two more. And we're gonna make the planet spiral involute. Okay, so we're gonna try to make that one. So I'm gonna take a bigger piece here, a bigger chunk of my Play-Doh. I'm gonna form a round ball. And I'm going to flatten it out. OK, so I have a round shape now. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to now break a little part right there like a little i'm going to tear it a little bit and that's going to make a hole right there okay and then i'm going to move that part where i made the hole just a little bit on top like that and then you can see in the picture I'm gonna make some lines. And there you go. Okay, so the last one I'm gonna make is a forearm called a ruber. So this one right here, okay? So what you're gonna need is you're gonna need three equal sized or almost equal, two balls that are the same size and one that's a little bit bigger. So let me take some here. those rounds. And then the third round here. So 
this, this one's pretty easy. So you're gonna put these two together just like that. And then for this one, you're gonna take, you can take a stick or you can take an eraser or a pencil. And I wanna make that aperture. It's kind of like an arch at the top. This, you can shape it with your hands. It looks kind of like a hood. So you're gonna make kind of like a hood. Okay, and then you're gonna take this and just place it on top. Okay, and just like that. So now you can see there's like those little holes. So if you wanna take a pencil, you can actually take a pencil and make the holes poke some holes on there to add those little details. Okay, and so while I make the holes there, if you wanna, if you have made your uh, forearms, you can take a picture of it and you can upload it to our Padlet. You can scan that QR code and upload your creation so we can see what you made. Okay, I think I'm almost ready to show you what this looks like. All right, there we go. All right, so let's take a look at, so once again, here's the ones we've created. All right, so let's take a look at the Padlet and see what you all have made. Okay, so here's another kind. Here's a unicereal forum. Here are some other ones I actually made earlier. And it looks like we have a lot here. Here's another. Another one. Oh, we have a drawing here. That looks really good. I like that one a lot. And here's another one. Here's a Ruber. We've got a lot of nice drawings here tonight. So yeah, keep up the good work. Keep taking pictures of your forum creations and you can put, um, add it to our Padlet page so we can see what you made. I'll just refresh one more time and see if there's any new pictures here. All right, so go ahead and finish your finish your creations and don't forget to upload them to our Padlet. All right, so now I would like to introduce our speaker for tonight. Um, our speaker is Ryan Glaubke and he will be talking to us about the oceans. So without further ado, Ryan, you can go ahead and, and take it away. Yeah, I would love to. Let me share my screen here. Okay, hopefully everyone should see that. Um, yeah, this is great. Rhea, thank you so much for that introduction. And thank you all for tuning in and for participating in trivia and crafts. Uh, this is actually my first late night. So I, I didn't know this existed before now, and it seems like a fun time and and uh, everyone at the museum puts on a uh, uh, does a great job in putting this together so thank you all for putting it together thank you all for tuning in 
I wish we could be doing this in person. I can see all your faces, but, but nonetheless, I'm excited to chat with you today about ocean circulation, quite literally the motion of the ocean, which is a cheesy title, I know, but it was, it was too easy not to name the talk that, so I'm sticking with it. Um, but today, what I want to talk to you about, let me just throw you guys out of my way there. Um, what I want to talk to you about in general is how and why oceans circulate and why you should care about it. So uh, if there's one thing I want you to take away from this talk about how ocean currents work is there's a bunch of different ways that ocean currents work. Different forces drive different kinds of circulation, but all of these are tied together into one complex planetary-wide circulation system that's incredibly important for the oceans and planet's health. But I'm going to break this down into three pieces today. I'm going to start off with looking at the surface of the ocean, and then I'm going to start talking about how the surface and the deep oceans are connected, uh, and then eventually take it to why you should care about ocean circulation, its in impact on Earth's climate. Um, so let's go ahead and start at the surface of the ocean. So this is a, a beautiful animation. I hope you all can see it okay at home. Uh, this shows the incredible mosaic of ocean currents and patterns that you get at the surface of the ocean. And there's such a rich diversity of features from large circular oceanic gyres that span entire ocean basins to small whirlpools called eddies that shoot, spin off in all these different directions here to Oceanic rivers, both small, like off the coast of the US here, to large all the way around Antarctica that transport monstrous amounts of seawater all over the planet. Um, and you can get all of these different features from three simple ingredients. And the first and most important, which was one of the trivia questions earlier, is the wind. So all of surface circulation is forced by winds to some extent. And Earth has prevailing wind patterns simply due to the fact that Earth's surface isn't evenly heated, right? We have the tropics, which are warm and, and great places to vacation. And then at the poles, it's really cold where none of us want to go on vacation, right? And the winds are set up to evenly distribute this heat across the planet. Now, the planet's wind system, which looks a little different depending on where you're at on the planet, it imparts energy into the ocean that helps it move along. So if we take our hypothetical block of ocean water here and we blow winds over the top of it, the friction between the air and the water at the surface there is gonna drag water along with it. And on top of that, the friction of the water uh, between the water at the surface and then just below it is going to drag it along as well, but slightly slower the deeper you go down. And the best way to illustrate this is with a deck of cards here. So if you have wind blowing over the surface ocean, you push these cards along. And of course, the top card is going to go the farthest, but those cards beneath are going to get dragged along as well. And that's because of friction. Uh, but I'm kind of teasing you here. This is a simplified way in which the winds and the surface ocean interact. And there's actually more nuance in the real world. This was best illustrated by um, a guy named Walfred Ekman. He's a Swedish physicist and oceanographer that lived in the early 19th century, I'm sorry, early 20th century, late 19th century. And in 1905, he set sail on a ship called the Fram in the North Atlantic. And while he was chilling out on the deck of the ocean or the ship, you know, doing whatever physicists did for fun in 1905, he noticed something really weird. And he was watching icebergs drift past the ship just like this. And he realized that the icebergs weren't floating along with the direction of the wind. They were drifting at about a 20 to 40 degree angle off of the direction of the wind. So that means the surface of the ocean wasn't flowing in the same direction. That surface ocean was deflected at an angle. And now just like the surface, the layers beneath that get dragged along, as I showed earlier, they were being deflected as well. So it's much like taking this deck of cards here and twisting, ooh, that was a bad demonstration, here you go, twisting the cards along with it. And, you know, this led him to come up with this crazy idea, which he named the Ekman spiral. See, when you discover something cool, you get to name it after yourself, which we all aspire to one day, whether scientists admit it or not. 
But the weird thing about this spiral though, it's, it's really cool in theory, but if you, if you think about the entire upper ocean and how water is moving in response to the wind, you get average transport at 90 degrees uh, relative to the way the wind is blowing completely in the wrong direction, right? The, you would expect the water to go along with the wind. It goes at a complete right or left-hand angle, depending on where you are on the planet. But why is that? Why is there this curvature in ocean flow relative to the wind? The answer to that is the second ingredient for our surface circulation. And that is the Cori, oh, sorry. To the right in the northern hemisphere, I'll explain this in a minute. This diagram is in the northern hemisphere. Coriolis force, that's our second ingredient here. The Coriolis force, which actually isn't a force, it deflects ocean currents from a straight path because the earth is rotating, right? So remember uh, earth's wind patterns here I just mentioned earlier, we see some curvature in the winds right here and that's due to the Cor Coriolis force. In the Northern Hemisphere, those winds are being deflected off to the right. And in the Southern Hemisphere, they're being de deflected to the left. Now, another way to illustrate this would be, imagine you're playing a really big game of catch, right? You're at the Northern Hemisphere and your buddy's at the equator and you throw the ball to your friend. Um, now, if the earth wasn't rotating, the ball would travel in a straight path to your friend at the equator and they would catch it, you know, provided you have a strong enough arm to get it to the equator, right? But because the earth is rotating beneath the ball that you throw, it's going to completely miss your friend entirely. And to us on planet earth, it's going to look like it has this right curvature to it rather than you know, what you would see from outer space, which is you throw the ball straight, but the earth is just rotating beneath that thrown ball. So this is why the Coriolis force is not actually a force. It's just a difference in perspective. But regardless, it has an important control on what features of surface circulation we see. And then finally, the third ingredient we have for surface circulation is probably the simplest, which is you know, the shape of the ocean basin in which you're stirring up the ocean, right? When you're stirring it up, the shape of the bowl you mix it in, you know, whether it's surrounded by a bunch of continents or by none at all, it has an, uh, an influence on what your current patterns look like. So we take the winds, we take the Coriolis force, we take the shape of the oceans themselves, and we put them all together and we get an incredible array of surface ocean features all around the globe. So I hope you can see this video at home. This is just a quick world tour of some really cool features. Uh, right here, we have the Gulf Stream, which is a strong, warm water current that brings waters up from South America and the equator all up the Southeast US coast and eventually out into Northern Europe. This current is incredibly important for Earth's climate and I'm gonna talk enough about that a little later. But if we travel a little further south down to the Southern tip of Africa, we get the Agulhas current, which actually has a huge leak in it right? The Agulhas sheds these huge whirlpools of warm salty water from the Indian Ocean that leak into the Atlantic. And that also has an important influence on Earth's climate. Now if we, if we creep up a little bit into the northern Indian Ocean, you can see these strong equatorial currents that are in response to the trade winds. But what's so unique about this region is that they completely reverse every year, which you can start to see right now, because of the shifting phases of the monsoon system. Now, just a little bit further east, we can see the Indonesian through flow, which is a region of a bunch of islands where Pacific water can leak into the Indian Ocean. As we start to creep up a little bit, we can see the Gulf Stream's cousin here, the Kuroshio Current, which travels along the east coast of Japan there. And then eventually, way to the east of the Pacific, we get this monstrous equatorial circulation in the Eastern Equatorial Pacific, which pushes so much water back towards Asia that it brings up waters that supply, nutrient rich waters that supply life uh, like you see in the Galapagos, uh, such rich diversity of life. Um, and finally, our last stop on this global tour here is the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. This is the largest current in the world. It's the only current that is not 
is not encumbered by any land barrier at all. So it can completely circumnavigate the planet all around Antarctica. And um, that makes it huge. It can build up, build up so much momentum and speed and depth that way. And so that's what makes it the largest current in the world. Now that's all really cool and dandy, but it's, it's important to note that surface circulation isn't everything. There's a uh, surface in the deep ocean, they're connected by a planet-wide circulation system that one oceanographer named Wally Broker, he coined it the Great Ocean Conveyor Belt. And so in very specific regions of the planet, like the North Atlantic here, water can sink from the surface to the deep uh, and then join a network of deep ocean currents that traverse it all around the planet. So what we're looking at here are waters sinking off the southern tip of Greenland, and then they get invected all the way down the Atlantic to the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. Uh, now these waters eventually spin off into the Indian and Pacific Oceans, upwell to the surface and make their way back to the Atlantic to complete the journey once again. But what, what exactly are we talking about here? I'll play this again. We're talking about tons of water. Around Antarctica in particular, the flow there is around 100 sphere drops. Well, Ryan, what the heck is a sphere drop? A sphere drop is 1 million cubic meters of water per second. So for context, all of the flow of all of Earth's rivers combined is about one sphere drop. So we're talking about a lot of water that's moving through Antarctica down here. But we're also talking about a lot of time. It takes about a thousand years for a parcel of water to go completely around on this conveyor belt. So it's, it's a massive system moving massive amounts of water. But how does it work? Turns out all you need are two simple ingredients, heat and salt. So this is why we gave it the super scientific name, thermohaline circulation. Thermo meaning heat and haline meaning salt. So heat and salt cause, cause waters to sink into the abyss and rise to the surface by changing the density of the water. So adding heat to the water increases the space between the water molecules and that, so that makes it less dense. So warm waters tend to rise. Whereas if you cool a water parcel, that brings the molecules closer together, makes it more dense, and so cold water sinks. Now, fresh water isn't bogged down by a bunch of dissolved salt, and so it's low in density. Fresh water tends to float. Whereas if you add in a bunch of salt to a glass of water, for instance, the density of that water increases, and so salty water tends to sink. So warm, fresh water is lighter than cold, salty water. And this is a picture from an experiment I, I did for a class recently where I pour, poured nearly freezing super salty water into a glass with warm and fresh water. And just look at that stratification. It's very, very clear where the warm and fresh water sits relative to the cold and salty water. So there's very specific regions on the planet where this density transformation happens. And so these are the cranks that drive the global conveyor belt. So one of these regions is the North Atlantic, where you have that warm water, warm, salty, tropical water that's being delivered by the Gulf Stream up into the North Atlantic, where it loses a lot of heat to the atmosphere. So it's cooling. And because it already brings so much salt with it, that cold, salty water gets really dense and it sinks in these great chimneys down to 2,000 meters depth, which is roughly 6,500 feet, something like that. Now, another region is in the Waddell Sea off of the Antarctic Peninsula. And the formation of these waters is a little different. The waters are already really cold around Antarctica. In fact, it's starting to freeze. You get a lot of sea ice down there. But salt isn't incorporated when water freezes. That salt stays in the water that hasn't yet frozen. And so any water that sea ice is forming in gets saltier and saltier with time. So it's already cold. You're increasing the salinity. You get really dense waters in this region. In fact, the waters that form here live at the very bottom of the ocean. I should mention that the, the process of the, the salt being excluded from the sea ice is called brine rejection. That's our super scientific term for it. 
Now, these waters sink from the surface down to depth and then get circulated out and eventually into the Indian and Pacific Oceans where they rise back to the surface. That's all well and dandy, but there's one region in particular where I think the upwelling of these waters is severely overlooked, and that's in the Southern Ocean. Now, there, this, the winds around Antarctica are so strong that, and they push so much water away from the coast that a lot of the deep water, 65% of all waters that occupy the interior of the ocean, come up to the surface around Antarctica. And it's, it's an incredibly important place uh, for uh, the exchange of deep and surface waters. But you know, when you look at it all together, this is Earth's circulation system. And a lot like our circulation system in our bodies distributes oxygen that keeps us healthy, the planet's circulation system, the thermohaline circulation system, is incredibly important for dis distributing heat, salt, carbon, nutrients critical for photosynthetic plankton that keeps the oceans and the planet healthy as well. It's also important for global climate. And one of the greatest examples of this is the Gulf Stream. So all of this water being funneled along the eastern coast of the United States and into the North Atlantic delivers one million power plants worth of heat to Northern Europe. And this is why the United Kingdom is such, has such a mild climate, right? You go to London and you're not freezing your butt off, despite London being at the same latitudinal band as Calgary, Canada, where the temperature difference is like 10 degrees C colder. So this important influence that the Gulf Stream has on Northern European climate has served as an inspiration for Hollywood. I'm sure some of you, some of you have seen this Day After Tomorrow movie. It's a horrible disaster movie that I, I have a soft spot for disaster movies. And the whole premise of this movie is that the Gulf Stream gets shut down by modern climate change. You have melting ice around Antarctica that dumps a bunch of fresh water into the North Atlantic. And because fresh water is less dense than the salty water needed to create that surface to deep transformation, it turns the circulation off. And that heat is no longer delivered to say, you know, North America or the northernmost northern hemisphere. And that ushers in a new ice age. Now, of course, that doesn't actually happen. But like all disaster movies, they start with some kernel of a scientific fact before taking some creative licenses. Um, and the fact here is that the Gulf Stream plays an important role in regulating the northern hemisphere's climate. Um, but I would argue that there's even an even more important ocean region for the planet's climate, and that is the Southern Ocean. So like I've said before, winds are bringing deep waters up to the surface all around the continent of Antarctica. And it turns out that that fundamental feature is really rescuing us from some of the worst aspects of modern climate change. These waters that come to the surface are great at absorbing heat and atmospheric carbon dioxide uh, from the overlying air and storing them back into the interior ocean where they don't really bother us anymore. So the Southern Ocean has absorbed anywhere between 67 to 98% of all excess heat from anthropogenic global warming. That's human induced global warming. And about half of all carbon dioxide emissions from human activities since the beginning of the industrial revolution. So this is great, you know, our, our warming and, and rising CO2 concentrations would be a lot worse, a lot more exacerbated if it wasn't for the Southern Ocean. But remember that this is not permanent. The Southern Ocean is helping us out, but it is not our permanent savior. As I hope you've picked up from our conveyor belt analogy, these waters eventually come back. It takes a long time, but they come back. And so while this is a really nice fact of our current existence, it's, it's not a permanent uh, solution. Um, but what's interesting is that we know changes in ocean circulation in the past have had a huge influence on the planet's climate before human activity was ever a factor. And this is what I research as a paleoclimatologist and a paleo-oceanographer, which is someone who studies old climates and old oceans. 
in my specialty here is 20,000 years ago when the planet was in the midst of the, the last of the great ice ages. Now, here you can see New Jersey just barely avoiding getting buried in, in miles of ice. And now what my job is, uh, my job as someone who studies the interactive mind, let's just cut, oh, whoops, let me turn my light back on here. Uh, okay, well, ignore me being in the dark. Um, now, for someone like me who studies the interaction between our climate and our oceans in the past, oh, there it is. Um, we know that the ocean circulation system operated much differently than it does then than it does today. And we know this because the planet keeps a natural archive of its history within the mud at the bottom of the ocean. And so I and a bunch of my colleagues get to go out to sea and sample the sea floor and use the information we unlock from the mud to recreate what Earth's oceans and climates looked like a long time ago and how they both changed as Earth climbed out of the last ice age and into the warm period that we live in today. And we do this by taking sediment cores, which are nothing more than a PVC pipe that we stick over the edge of the ship and poke holes with at the bottom of the ocean. We haul it back up to the surface. And that's what this, infra, uh, this video shows here with, uh, oh, okay, I'm back. This is what this video is showing here with us on our cruise three years ago in the middle of the Indian Ocean. Now we pull these cores up from the bottom of the ocean and we split them open and they have these beautiful layers that are like pages in a book or, or, or rings in a, in a cross section of a tree. And each layer represents a period in time. And as you travel from the top of the mud down to the bottom, you're traveling back in time. And what's phenomenal about these sediment cores is trapped within the layers of the mud are these tiny fossils called foraminifera. These are the amazing little sh uh, creatures you were making with clay earlier. Um, and what's amazing about these single cell creatures is that they form, they build shells where they're alive and the information about the chemistry of the water, which can tell us about ocean temperature, salinity, nutrient content, the size of the ice caps, all of it gets preserved within the shell's chemical composition. And with that information, we can piece together how different states of ocean circulation affected Earth's climate evolution tens, hundreds of thousands of years down to millions of years ago. Now these shells contain fingerprints of what the planet looked like way back when. And it's my job and a bunch of other people's jobs to reconstruct that history back before we had scientists with thermometers and current meters to take measurements of uh, the oceans in real time. And we can learn a lot from our past and those lessons are gonna help us navigate what's coming down the pipeline, what, uh, help us navigate our future. Uh, a future that may seem uncertain now, but one that becomes clearer and clearer with every sediment core that we bring back up from the abyss. And so with that, I wanna thank you all for listening to me and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions as well as share as many photos as you'd like to see from our time at sea. Uh, so thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Um, so if you go to the Google doc, there are a lot of questions for you. Oh, great. Let me get the Google doc open. So should I read them out and then answer them? Yes. Okay, first question from Connie who says, what was the most fascinating fact that you learned about the ocean? Oh, that's a big, that's a big thing to choose from. Um, oh my gosh, I would say that the, the ocean is such a huge, capacitor of heat and carbon. It's, it's like a giant sponge that soaks up a lot of heat and carbon from the atmosphere, um, particularly in the Southern Ocean, but generally um, that, that kind of gives us, buys us some time to make the necessary decisions we need to make in order to stave off the worst impacts of modern climate change. And so we can thank the oceans for that. 
um, but that comes with its own consequences. This is often uh, uh, referred to as um, the other CO2 problem, which is ocean acidification. We're removing a lot of CO2 from the atmosphere and that's saving us from you know, too much warming, but adding CO2 to the ocean decreases its pH, it becomes more acidic. And that's what you know, throws a bunch of calcifying organisms into whack. Um, and of course, heat being absorbed by the ocean is, is really good for us as well, but you get these large marine heat waves that have a, a, a terrible impact on a marine life. And so it's a double-edged sword, uh, but it buys us some time. Um, but that's a great question. Um, so Rhea's mom would like to know, have I ever been on a research cruise? Uh, if yes, which ocean were you in and what were you studying there? Yeah, so I answered that right at the end. The last research cruise I was on was in uh, the central Indian Ocean, uh, really far away from, from civilization. Um, uh, we went out three years ago and we're interested in studying how the Southern Ocean's circulation that I showed earlier um, in the Indian sector of the Southern Ocean, how that changed over the last 22,000 years. Um, because as, as simple of a model as I showed for Southern Ocean circulation, it's actually quite different whether you're in the Atlantic sector, the Indian sector, or the Pacific sector. And the Indian sector is, is really understudied. You know, everyone goes to the Atlantic. That is, you know, where everyone studied for long uh, stretches of, you know, oceanographic history. Uh, and the Pacific was the hot new thing 10 years ago. But now the Indian Ocean is, is it's starting to look like that is a really important region. And we were the first to go there and get some cores. And so my PhD is trying to clarify that. Um, and have we seen any sharks? I did not see any sharks, but we saw a lot of wildlife, um, which let me, I can, I can show brief pictures of here. Um, let me go to my slideshow and share my screen. You're gonna make me share photos. So we got, saw a bunch of albatross, which are these large birds that live in the Southern Ocean. Um, we had uh, a few days where we were surrounded by a small volcanic island. We were sailing around a small volcanic island and this species of bird you will only find on that small volcanic island, uh, which is really cool. We saw a bunch of minke whales and we saw uh, a seal that was very friendly to us and would eat Cheetos that we threw off the back of the ship. Um, except the bacon flavored ones. We had really disgusting um, bacon flavored, flavored Cheetos from Australia and no one liked them. So we tried to feed them to the wildlife and uh, they did not like it either. Um, but we saw a bunch of jellyfish and then even under the microscope, you saw a great diversity of life um, in our samples. Um, so these are just a few examples of that. So no sharks incidentally, but um, a lot of, whoops, let me stop sharing here a lot of great examples of marine life. Um, now, let me go back to the questions here, sorry. Okay, uh, do ocean currents affect sea animals? Yes, yes, absolutely. Not only in transporting nutrients um, that are necessary for phytoplankton to grow, which is the base of the food web, but if, if anyone's seen Finding Nemo, the uh, turtle scene in Finding Nemo, they're, they're riding the East Australian current, which I didn't show in my video, but it's important for their migratory habits. And that there's examples of that all around the world. So absolutely, ocean currents, um, like sea animals evolve to take advantage of uh, ocean currents that exist in their, in their habitat. So absolutely, the answer is yes. Um, do ocean currents always go in the same direction or do they ever change? I think I touched on that in my talk. In the Northern Indian Ocean in particular, you get a complete 180 degree reversal of the current direction. And that's because in the summertime, during the monsoon season, you have a bunch of winds blowing from the ocean onto the Indian continent. And that's when you get a bunch of torrential rains. But in the winter time, the winds shift direction and blow off of the Indian continent and onto the ocean. And so that complete reversal of the winds churns up the ocean and switches directions of the currents entirely. 
So uh, yeah, it's, it's the only place in the world that does that. So it's a really unique region. Um, why is the ocean water so cold off of California, even in the summer? Great question. So winds blow south on the Californian coast. So from Maine, or not Maine, that's the wrong coast, from you know Washington, Oregon, down the Californian coast. And because of the Coriolis force, which deflects water to the right in the Northern hemisphere, those winds push water away from the coast of California. And when you do that, something has to rise to take the place of the waters you just pushed away. And so we call that coastal upwelling. And the waters that rise from the deep are really cold. They're not sitting at the surface of the ocean, soaking in all the hot California sun to warm it up. And that's really good for the uh, kinds of sea life you see around California, because those waters are also really rich in nutrients. And so no matter what time of year it is, you get this coastal upwelling along California that keeps the coast really cold which is the opposite of what you see, say, in North Carolina or Virginia, because the Gulf Stream is right there. You don't have upwelling. And the waters in the summertime are actually quite warm. It's uh, Sometimes it feels like bath water. I'm from Virginia. And when you, it's really hot in the middle of August and you want to go to the beach to cool off, the water isn't very cool and not really good at cooling you off. So um, yeah, great question. Um, can the circulation system shut down? What would happen if it did? So. That was, the answer is yes, uh, or at least we think it shut down before. That was the inspiration for the Day After Tomorrow movie. About 14,000 years ago, there was uh, the ice sheet that occupied the Northern Hemisphere during the last ice age was beginning to crumble away. Um, and there was a large pool of meltwater on top of the ice cap that didn't make it into the ocean yet. It formed a great freshwater lake, and eventually that uh, that dam, that glacial dam that held it from the ocean broke and it dumped a bunch of fresh water into the North Atlantic. We think that was enough to shut down the ocean currents. And there's evidence that we had a brief return to ice age like conditions. This was called the Younger Dryas event 14,000 years ago. This was the inspiration for the Day After Tomorrow movie. Of course, that took thousands of years to happen rather than three days like the movie suggests. Um, but what's interesting today, because the planet's warming and the glacial ice on Greenland is melting, there's some evidence to suggest that the ocean currents now are beginning to slow down. Um, we don't know yet if it's enough to turn it off completely like an extreme case way back when, but we know that it's going to have some influence on ocean currents and um, people like myself are still trying to figure out what that means for our future. Um, Suli would like to know, uh, what are some changes we are currently seeing in the ocean as a result of climate change? Slowing down ocean currents, uh, marine heat waves because of all the heat that's been taken up, uh, ocean acidification because all the CO2 that it absorbs reduces the pH of the water. Um, and all of that has in, impacts on the abundance and, and prevalence, geographical prevalence of certain kinds of marine life. Um, yeah, so I, I, I listed quite a few there, so I hope that answered your question. Uh, Robin would like to know, what are, what are the differences between the information we gain from, gain from analyzing sediment cores from land versus the ocean? Uh, yeah, so sediment cores from the ocean tell us mostly about the ocean. Right, because the, the animals, the shells we're using to reconstruct past conditions, they were living in the ocean. Um, but there's a bunch of terrestrial records that we can use like uh, lake sediment cores, where we can use pollen from plants that have fallen into the lake and settled into the sediments um, to reconstruct the prevalence of certain land plants on uh, different continents. Like um, some of the most famous pollen records are from South America, Australia, New Zealand, um, there's also, uh, you can use cores of glacial ice from Antarctica that can tell us about air temperatures over Antarctica. And what I'm trying to say is you can take records from land and these records we generate from the ocean and tie them all together to get a more holistic picture of what the planet looks like through time. Um, Sue would like to know, are we, are you, you seeing major changes in the water circulation and would discontinuing fossil fuel help the water circulation? 
So the answer is yes, we're seeing significant changes in ocean circulation um, because of the warming that's happening right now due to human activity. Now, if we were to turn off CO2 emissions today, there is a certain inertia in the system to where um, it takes about 50 years for all the CO2 to kind of evenly mix throughout the, uh, the global atmosphere. And so warming would continue for another 50 years if we just turned off all power plants today. Um, and there's warming associated with that as well. So probably almost two degrees C of warming if we were to stop today. That is accompanied by some measure of melting from Greenland. And we don't quite know if that would be enough to push the circulation system beyond a point that um, you can't come back from. This is what we call tipping points, right? And there's still a, a legitimate scientific debate about this. There was a, a paper that's come out recently that said, ah, oh, we're past the tipping point. And another paper that came out was like, ah, oh, we don't quite like the data you're using to come up with that conclusion. So uh, tipping points are really tricky to find because we're running a real time experiment on the planet's climate system, its oceans, its atmosphere. And we don't have direct analogs for what's happening with the planet today. The, the rate of change we see in the past is much, much slower compared to what we've done to the climate in the last 200 years or so. Um, and so it's, it's hard to come up with those tipping points, but the smartest people are working on it. Um, I wouldn't consider myself the smartest people, but the smartest people are working on it. Uh, do you have a favorite ocean current? Ooh, yeah, the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, I would say. It's, it's massive. It's massive. It's, it's because you have no land to obstruct that current, it just keeps going and going and going to the point where, um, I don't know if you saw the, the cube of ocean I talked about earlier, but usually the surface currents are only felt down to about 200 meters or 600 feet of seawater. The Antarctic circumpolar current goes all the way to the bottom, all the way to the bottom. And uh, what's great about that is you can use sediments as like an ancient current meter because the current reaches so far down, we can reconstruct how fast the current may have been flowing back in time just based on how much sediment it carries away with it, um, which is an amazing fact in and of itself. So yeah, I would say the Antarctic Circumpolar Current is my favorite. Um, let's say uh, Steve asks, favorite rock found in the ocean? Oh man, favorite rock. Uh, I don't know how many of you know about manganese nodules. They're like, they look like bulbous, black. They almost look like, like small animal droplet, uh, drop, uh, droppings, which is a little off-putting, but they take millions of years to form, millions of years. And they're sponges for uh, heavy metals floating around in the water. And uh, for a short time, the US government was toying around with the idea of mining them. The problem is they occur very deep in the ocean and they're very hard to find. Um, when we were out in the middle of the Indian Ocean, we were poking holes in the ocean, getting all the mud and whatnot. We pull up one of our sediment cores and it has 50 manganese nodules in it. And so each of us got to take one home. And um, I think I have it behind me. Uh, I think it's somewhere up there. I can't find it, but um, yeah, we each got to take one home, which is, uh, was really cool. So those are incredibly rare to find. Um, can you talk a little bit about what it's like living on a research cruise? What's a typical typical day on the ship look like? Yeah, let me uh, pull up a few pictures that show that. Um, I don't have to do the slideshow. I can just pull up the thing. Um, <laughs> one thing is it's a dirty job. There's a lot of mud involved and you get soaked in seawater and uh, as you can see from all of my friends here, it's, uh, it doesn't keep us from having a good time. Um, the shifts are quite long. This is us in the computer lab of the ship here, uh, working away, trying to find mud at the bottom of the ocean. Um, every day, no matter whether it's a weekday or a weekend, you're working 12 hour shifts, 12 hours on, 12 hours off. And, um, sometimes you get really mixed up, like, uh, I was working the, the midnight to noon shift. So 
my breakfast was dinner leftovers from the day prior and my dinner was whatever they were having for lunch the next day and I would go to bed at noon um and uh it's it's a lot of hard work um this is a shot of us on the night shift uh the best part about the night shift was all the great sunrises we got to see and these are just a few of the pictures that we got to take um early in the morning this is one of the volcanic islands right here that we were sailing around and uh, here's our multi-core, which helps us take a bunch of sediment cores at once um, over the back end of the ship. Um, it's a great time. Um, you get to see some crazy sights. This is uh, uh, me at the uh, largest of the volcanic islands that we visited. And this was it at sunrise. Um, yeah, it's, um, it's a really fun time at sea. I, it's a lot of hard work and it's, it can be really tiresome sometimes. I, I would say that, um, you know, uh, this cruise we did in the Indian Ocean was two months long, and that can be grueling when you're working 12 hours every day. Um, but uh, it doesn't stop me from wanting to go again. Actually, all of us are sailing back out. In four weeks, we're going to Nova Scotia. And luckily, this is only a two week cruise, so it's not going to be as taxing as the last, last one was, but um, it's, uh, it's a really fun time. And when you're surrounded by people who are interested in the kinds of scientific topics you are, and, and all of them are so much smarter than you, like my colleagues are, um, you get to essentially spend time on a boat, do hard work together and talk about crazy ideas about Earth history and, and the oceans, and it's so much fun. Um, so next question, can you talk about the research cruise you were going on in June? Yeah, that, that was, I just mentioned it. This is um, a, a trip where we're sailing out of Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in Massachusetts. We're sailing south off of the Jersey coast to take some cores along the continental slope just off the coast. So we're getting sediment cores from a shallow part of the water column and then down the slope sampling deeper and deeper and then going back up to Nova Scotia and doing the same thing. And the reason you do this is because you can get yourself a three-dimensional view of how the ocean might be changing with time. You've got cores from shallow depths to deeper depths and you have a southern transect and a northern transect. And so when you generate the different records that we do, you get this cool 3D snapshot of how it changes with time. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's going to be a great time. Um, we're sailing on the uh, RV Atlantis, which is the, the famous research vessel that houses the Alvin, which is the one that dove down and uh, discovered the Titanic and discovered hydrothermal vents. And so it's going to be a great time. Um, let's see. Uh, Re would like to know, are you seeing major changes in the water circulation and would discontinue? OK, yeah, I answered that one. Um, Layla would like to know, you may have mentioned this, but do you know how much of the ocean we've actually discovered so far? Yeah, so more than 80% of our ocean is unmapped, unobserved, and unexplored. And this is, oh, there go my lights again. Um, we have a good idea of what the ocean generally looks like, but we don't have a high resolution picture of what the ocean looks like everywhere. And so anytime we go out on a research cruise, we bring along a bathymetric scanner to get high resolution pictures of what's beneath our feet. Um, and this is what we did um, when we were coming back from the Indian Ocean cruise. Some scientists in Australia were like, hey, we have Perth Canyon off the coast of Western Australia. It's a marine protected area and it's super important for our regional economies and we actually don't know what it looks like all that well. So can you please take a bathymetric scan of it and, and give us the data? And we did that on our way in and um, got some beautiful photos of the, of the canyon. And so every day we're learning more about what the bottom of the ocean looks like. And sometimes you discover small seamounts uh, like we did in the Indian Ocean that we tried to name after uh, our colleague Harris who discovered it, but it turns out you can't name features after yourself unless you're incredibly successful or you've recently died. So we got turned down, <laughs> unfortunately. 
Um, okay, it looks like the last question here, how and why did you decide to study paleoceanography? Uh, by complete circumstance, um, I was doing my undergraduate research at Old Dominion University, which is in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, and I was going through a program that was highly interdisciplinary. So it was earth sciences and ocean sciences, climate science. And I was specializing in geology and geochemistry, uh, but I had no idea what you would do with that. Uh, the only thing I thought you could do was, you know, mapping the sea floor, which is, it sounded cool, but it, it didn't, there wasn't a burning question other than what's the sea floor look like, right? Um, and uh, it took a new faculty hire in our department, Ma uh, Dr. Matthew Schmidt. Um, he, our department's pretty small, and so, and I was a involved student, so I just went to his office and was like, oh, hi, it's nice to meet you. Welcome to ODU. I can't wait to take any classes you're offering, and he was like, do you want to hear a little bit about my research? And I'm like, yeah, sure. And he told me about a sediment core he had from the S Florida Straits, which are between Florida and uh, some of the Caribbean islands. Um, and he was like, we can reconstruct temperature, salinity, and how fast the Gulf Stream was flowing during the last ice age. And I was like, what? That's amazing. And it, it, it leveraged all of the geochemistry um, information I was learning in my undergrad. And so uh, one day I, I read a couple of his papers and invited him to lunch and took him to my favorite coffee shop and asked him all of these questions uh, about his paper. And to this day, he says I schmoozed him. Um, but afterwards, I was just like, can I please be your graduate student? I want to go to grad school and I want to do this. And he said, yes. So I stayed at ODU for an additional three years after my undergraduate. I got my master's. Uh, and I fell in love with paleo climate and I got to meet people on this cruise, the Indian Ocean cruise. And that's how I eventually came to Rutgers. So, um, and all of that was a bit compounded by where I was living at the time, Norfolk, Virginia, which is the second largest metropolitan city in the United States that is susceptible to sea level rise. Uh, number one being New Orleans, right? So every day I'd have to fight flooded streets to get to work or get to class. And that really put climate change right in front of my face. I couldn't ignore it. Uh, and I, I kind of fell in love with this idea that we can learn lessons from our past to better anticipate our future. And that's the, that's the line that keeps me going uh, in this kind of research. Uh, oh, one more question. Uh, not to get too existential, but based on the pics you shared on your trips, have you ever had a moment of awareness or feeling utterly insignificant to the scale of the planet? Oh my gosh, the planet's huge. Like I, I was showing you uh, these pictures of this huge volcanic island with these huge uh, sloping hills and sheer cliffs. Like you can't even see, these are huge waves that are battering against the cliff face here. Uh, this island is so small, you will not find it on most maps. And that's baffling to me. Uh, the fact that it took us over a month to get from Western Australia to, you know, the midway point between Australia and Madagascar in the Indian Ocean. That's, I mean, we, we didn't take a direct line there, but still it, it gives you a sense of the, the sheer scale of the planet. Um, but at the same time, there, there's so, Many of us, there's there's a significant amount of people living on this huge planet that collectively we can have an impact on how the oceans work, how the atmosphere works, how warm it is in certain parts of the planet over others. Um, and it's just sometimes it's it can be overwhelming, I, I think. And, and that's why maybe it's useful to have a large community of scientists like we do in paleoclimate where you know, I work on this particular region of the Indian Ocean while someone else is doing excellent work in the Western Pacific. And we all go to conferences and bring the pieces together and put out reports like the international or the intergovernmental panel on climate change, the IPCC reports that give us this uh, 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 overarching consensus of what we think is going on and, and how we think we can fix it. Um, so yeah, I, the, the planet's huge, but at the same time, it's so tiny uh, in, in, in that, you know, we're everywhere on this planet and, it, and this is the only planet we have. And so 
we have to do the best we can to be the best stewards that we can be. Um, and so I think that's the last question. So uh, thank you all so much for the excellent questions. I, I loved talking with you all and hopefully I'll be able to see some of you in person someday. Thank you so much, Brian. That was really great. And I agree, like everyone had really good questions and uh, you had even uh, really great answers for everybody. Um, so thank you once again for, uh, for doing this for us. And thank you to our audience uh, for being so wonderful and participating tonight. Um, and yeah, so thanks again. And I hope everyone has a good night. Thank you, everyone.